Hello, y'all. Thanks for tuning in to our Southern Four Wheel Drive Association's TechNet tonight. Um, as you know, Southern continues to focus on education, conservation, and recreation. And our TechNet is one of our main ways of getting information out to you guys on things that's important for off roading. This evening, Mike's going to be talking with us about how to prepare for a trail ride, what you need to have in your vehicle. We, uh, you can ask questions, as always, uh, in the comments. It would help us if you'll preface your question with a Q. Uh, that way we can see it easy. Um, and then I'm going to let Mike tell us about our grand prize for the night. Mike? All right. What's up, Facebook world? So we've got uh, our grand prize, as always, sponsored by BF Goodrich. They have given us not one, not two, not three, not four, but five tires to give away with this season of TechNet. So up to 37 inches, KO2 or KM3 tires, you are entered every time that you watch a live stream live and comment what Al tells you to comment. You're entered for a chance to win those tires. Drawing will be held at Trail Fest, right? But you do not have to be present to win. To win. But who wants to miss out on Trail Fest, right? We all want to be there, so be there or be square. Okay, now tonight, I'm going to, about midway through the talk, Mike, I'll flash up a little message. Just actually, I'm going to ask a question tonight. If you don't answer the question correctly, you won't be entered to win a set of tires. But it's an easy question. Trail Fest is coming up April the 30th through May the 2nd. And we have guided trail rides. We have an excursion ride. We have a raffle that is, is this is going to be one of our biggest raffles we've had in, in many years. As soon as TechNet's over tonight, we'll open up a registration page on the Southern Four Wheel Drive Association's webpage where you can sign up for one of the guided rides. We've got about 12 different guided rides spread across uh, Friday and Saturday. Some of our guided rides are sponsored by vendors. Warren is sponsoring two of them. BF Goodrich is sponsoring one. And we expect other sponsors to step up and jump on board and sponsor some of these other rides. Tonight, we're going to give, uh, if you comment, and a, a lot of people's already commented. We've got 23 people watching. And as you, if you comment, you'll be re registered to win one of these neat little bottles. What to leave out, Mike? I, I think that's it. I think the most important thing is, is that everybody needs to make sure they are at Trail Fest. It is the event to be at. You already heard it is the biggest raffle that Southern Four Wheel Drive's probably put on. Um, so if you want to win some cool products, you better be there. Okay, so Mike, tell us about what I need in my vehicle, what I need to do before I leave home, and what am I going to need to have when I go out on one of these trail rides? Awesome. All right. Yeah. So tonight we're going to talk about what to carry in your vehicle um, or to make sure that you have in your con convoy when you're going on a trail ride or at an event like Trail Fest. We're also going to talk about kind of how to go through some of this stuff before we even leave out to go uh, leave home to go to these events or trail rides. So I'm going to break it out a little bit. We're going to talk about kind of recovery gear that we should carry. Um, and how to check some of that recovery gear before we leave. Then we're going to talk about vehicle safety and how we should kind of prepare for that and what we should carry for our vehicle safety. And then the last part we're going to talk about is our kind of person safety or personal safety and items that we should carry on the trail. So now this is going to be a pretty exhaustive list, right? There's tons of different things that we can carry and some people carry more than others. The most important things um, that we really need to think about is, number one, that we really should not be going off-roading alone, right? That way, we can spread these items out throughout multiple vehicles and make sure that everyone has what they need to be safe and enjoy the trail for the day. So let's start with uh, recovery gear, right? We've, we've done a tech, we've done several tech nets talking about recovery gear. One. We even had Warren Winch come in and talk about winching, but what recovery gear do we really absolutely need on the trail? So some of that is subjective, right? Do you have a winch on your vehicle? If you do have a winch, 
you're going to carry one set of recovery gear versus if you're a vehicle without a winch, right? But what I carry when I go out on the trail is I always carry two tree straps, right? And they are three inches wide. It's typically somewhere between the six to 10 foot in length. So two tree straps. Then I carry two pulley blocks, right? Pulley blocks rated to double my winch capacity. And I make sure that they are correct for whether I have synthetic winch line or steel cable, right? Then after that, I'm going to carry one winch line extension, okay? Normally somewhere in the range of about 30 to 50 feet. Um, I like to carry a little bit longer winch line extension and less line on my winch, right? After that, I carry three bow shackles and three soft shackles and a lot of people ask me well why don't you carry just soft shackles or just bow shackles well so soft shackles are safer right they are safer than our standard bow shackles that we have um, but we can't always use soft shackles because just like our synthetic winch line they are susceptible to abrasion they are also a wearable item so we don't want to just carry one or the other if we're typically, if I'm doing kinetic recoveries and the situation allows it, I default to soft shackles. But if I don't have a sharp recovery point or a sharp edge or something that it's going to come in contact with, I go ahead and put those bow shackles on. So I make sure to carry three of each. That way I know that I'm going to have plenty. After that, uh, for recovery gear, I do carry a kinetic strap or a kinetic recovery rope some type of recovery rope or strap that has stretch in it, right? That way, if I have to do a vehicle to vehicle extraction, I'm using some momentum, it's gonna absorb that initial shock load and transfer that kinetic energy to the stuck vehicle. So then I'm carrying a high lift jack and I carry one section of chain, right? Three eighths G70 rating and typically no more than eight to 10 feet, right? And the chain, you know, depending on where you're going and what you're using it for, you may not have to carry it, but it is a good piece of kit to carry because if I have to drag a tree off the trail or if I have to move a rock out of the way, I'm going to use that chain so I don't damage one of my straps. Then one of the most important pieces of recovery kit that I carry is a good pair of leather palmed gloves, some type of work gloves like your really heavy duty impact mechanics gloves. Um, or something of that nature, right? Because no matter what recovery gear we're messing with, we're always wearing gloves when we're working with those. So, and there again is a ton of other recovery gear that we could add to that, but I always make sure that those items are what I'm most definitely carrying with me. And so a lot of that I will lay out beforehand, before I even leave on my trip. I go ahead and lay it out at home so I can inspect it, right? All of my soft recovery gear, my straps, my winch line extension, even my synthetic winch line on my winch, kinetic ropes, any type of soft recovery gear like that, I'm laying it out, making sure it's in good serviceable condition, doesn't have any cuts, abrasions, or it got packed way wet and it's moldy. So I want to make sure that it's all clean and serviceable. Then, with my recovery gear, the next step is laying out my high lift jack. Make sure that it doesn't need to be rebuilt, right? So if it does need to be rebuilt, I go ahead and do that with just using a standard rebuild kit from high lift jack that replaces the climbing pins, cross pins, springs, and shear pin. So then I go ahead and I lube that high lift jack, right? Put a little bit of um, silicone spray or WD-40 or something on it just to keep it working. But I still carry a little bit of lube with me um, when I go out because if it's dusty, that high lift jack's just going to attract dust and I'm going to have to use it again. But I just make sure it's in serviceable condition again before I even leave home. One of the main things that I always check and double check is my winch controller, right? I can't tell you how many times on a trail ride where I've gone out and somebody gets stuck, I'm guiding the trail ride, and they say, well, I've got a winch. I just had it put on. And one of two things happens. I say, all right, well, let's see your winch controller. And they don't have it. They forgot it at home. Or the winch controller is buried underneath all their other gear. So now we've got to dig it out, sometimes in a precarious position. So always make sure that you have your winch controller and you pack it where it needs to be, right? Easily accessible. I typically will keep mine in a center console of a vehicle 
or even in the glove box because then I can get access to it relatively quickly. And since you're double checking before you even leave home that you have your winch controller, go ahead and plug it in and double check to make sure your winch works, right? Just a quick bump out of the trigger, bump back in, or go ahead and spool all your winch line out and spool it back up nice and clean to make sure that all of your synthetic winch line is serviceable, right? And in good condition, doesn't have any nicks, cuts, or abrasions in it. So super important in that aspect. I have yes, a question sir. for you. So I, all right. I, I spool my synthetic line out and I get it all nice and clean. And then I spool it back really neatly onto the drum of my winch. But then the next time when I pull it out to use it and I put tension on it, it cuts down into the lower couple of rounds. Yes. How do I prevent that? So ultimately, your two things. Your synthetic winch line and even steel cable wants to be tensioned when it's put up. Um, with synthetic winch line, it takes a whole lot less tension. You know, about 500 pounds um, of tension against it to kind of tension it in place. Uh, with steel cable, you're looking at somewhere between 1,200 and 1,500 pounds to tension that winch line in place. But the other one is, is as you're spooling it back on, there's actually a specific angle for synthetic winch line that you want to keep it back against itself as it spools across, and it's called a fleet angle. So as you're working the synthetic winch line across, you actually want to keep some tension against it, each wrap around that drum, right? So that it spools nice and tight. And when you're keeping tension against it as well, out from the winch, it'll get pulled nice and tight, and it'll be a whole lot harder for that synthetic winch line to kind of split down in between itself. So, um, but that is very common with synthetic winch line that it will, when you pull against it, it will tend to cut down in between itself and it can become jammed like that as well. So excellent question. Um, so once we've kind of got all our recovery gear together, we've checked it and we made sure it's all serviceable. This is probably one of the most commonly overlooked things with our recovery gear is packing it correctly in the vehicle. Now, some of this stuff is very heavy. But so we don't want to pack it high on top of all of our gear and stuff. We want to keep it down low inside the vehicle, right? But we want to keep it easily accessible. Nothing's worse than getting stuck on the trail. And now it takes five minutes to unpack your vehicle to access all your recovery gear, right? So keep it somewhere that's easily accessible that you can get to it. But make sure that in the event of a rollover or, um, a flop on the trailer just bouncing around that you don't have recovery gear bouncing around inside the vehicle. Again, some of it's heavy. Now, I know some of you right now are probably thinking, well, Mike, geez, that is a really whole lot of recovery gear to carry. It is, right? It is. And this is why I say, again, going out with a group, you can spread that recovery gear out a little bit. You know, um, that way, again, not everybody has to carry a section of chain. Not everybody has to carry two or three pulley blocks. But if you have multiple vehicles, you can spread that load out. And this vehicle carries chain, but this vehicle carries the pulley blocks. This vehicle carries the winch line extension. And that way you're not overloading one vehicle with all the recovery gear. So keep that in mind with kind of how you go through that process. Um, and again, most importantly, checking that recovery gear before you leave to go on a trip. Super important to make sure it's all serviceable and in good condition. All right, so that is recovery gear. Now let's talk about things and items we need to make sure that we have in our vehicle for vehicle health, right? Our vehicle survivability. And this is, this is very, very uh, kind of subjective for vehicle to vehicle. So I'm gonna keep it somewhat generic, but first and for foremost for our vehicle, if you, are going to an event or on a trail ride, you need to have a fire extinguisher, right? And know where those fire extinguishers are located. Again, not packed away underneath everything. Um, typical kind of general rule of thumb is, is if a fire does ignite on your vehicle, you need to be able to access your fire extinguisher in 45 seconds or less. If you can't access it within 45 seconds or less, typically it's going to be almost too late. You may not be able to get the fire out, especially if it's caught something like uh, transmission fluid or something combustible on fire. So make sure that you have a fire extinguisher in your vehicle and that you can easily get to it. Nothing wrong, because again, a lot of times we're carrying those smaller 
um, fire extinguishers. Nothing wrong with carrying multiple fire extinguishers, right? That way you can have one in front of the vehicle and up towards the front by the driver and passenger and one at the rear of the vehicle. So you can easily access one no matter what, and you've got a spare in case someone else needs it while you're on the trail. Now, if you come to Trail Fest or Dixie Run, a Southern Four Wheel Drive event, they're going to check to make sure that you've got your fire extinguisher. So make sure you got one in your rig when you come. Now, the next most important kit to carry, right? You need to carry a complete tire repair kit, right? And what do I mean by a complete tire repair kit? Well, not just tire plugs and a tire plug tool. You need to go ahead and carry a tire plug kit or tire repair kit that's got a whole host of different things. And I've got one to show here today. But the one I carry is this Speedy Seal one by ARB. Um, and there's other companies that have one very similar to this. But this kit right here comes with a whole multitude of tire plugs, right, which is just a piece of um, string or cordage that's got a really sticky residue on it for plugging tires. And it comes with a whole bunch of those. It also comes with a razor knife, a pair of needle nose pliers here. It comes with a little bit of tire lube. It comes with your plug tool, a metal T-handled plug tool, not a plastic one, right? You need that metal T-handled plug tool because if you have a plastic one and you try to plug some of these heavy-duty off-road tires, that plastic handle is going to break and this is going to go through your hand. So you're going to have to have a plug for your hand, right? And then a metal T-handle reamer tool for cleaning out the hole and getting it big enough to be able to put one of the tire plugs in. Um, typically, uh, some type of tire gauge to check your tire pressure. And then I always make sure that I carry extra valve stem cores, these little Schrader valves, right? You can't really see them on video, but these extra Schrader valves that are inside of your valve stems. I carry extra valve stem caps because if I crush one or break one, then I want to make sure that my valve stem stays sealed off from mud and stuff. And then I carry one of these four-way tools that you can see right here that's for working with the valve stem and Schrader valves. So, and I'll carry a couple of extra valve stems just in the event I damage a valve stem. Or you can carry some of the Colby tire valves that you can replace without even de-beating a tire. Um, you don't even have to replace them from the inside. But a good, complete tire repair kit is huge to carry, right? And again, not everyone has to have one, but you need to have a couple in the group. That way you can fix flats on the trail. Especially if you're not, not running BF Goodrich tires, you might end up with a flat, right? So um, carry that tire repair kit. The other thing that I make sure I have is a good compressor, right? and some way to air up my tires and measure the air pressure in my tires. I do carry a digital tire inflation gauge with an air compressor on my vehicle so that I can air myself back up before I get on the road. And again, vehicle health includes your tires too. So this is very, very important that you air your tires back up before you get on the road. If you drive on the road with too low air pressure, your tires could separate and cause a uh, bad vehicle accident, right? Then I'm carrying some way to air my tires down. Number one rule off-road is you air your tires down because it helps your vehicle out, it's more comfortable for you, and you're being environmentally um, conscious when you do that because by airing down, we're taking care of the trail, we're taking care of our vehicle, and we're taking care of ourselves. So, and I typically will carry more than one weight air or more than one air down tool. That way I can kind of pass them around because we don't want to be sitting on the trailhead waiting, you know, 15, 20 minutes for everybody to air down. So if we have multiples, we can pass them around and we can get that process going a lot faster, right? All right. So after you've kind of got your nice, um, all your tire stuff kind of squared away, then move on to a good, complete toolkit specific to your vehicle, right, and your skill level as a mechanic. Don't necessarily carry tools that are way outside of your skill level because chances are if someone has the ability to work on something on your vehicle, they're probably going to have the tools too. But if you have a basic set of tools for your vehicle that, again, is specific to your vehicle, that's what you need to carry. I drive Toyotas a lot, 
So a lot of times I'll have a set of metric tools in my vehicle, um, sockets and box end wrenches, and some uh, specific sizes that are kind of specific to the Toyota world. But if you have a Jeep, right, carrying standard tools, or if you have one of the newer Jeeps, maybe standard and metric, right? You're starting to see more and more metric on those vehicles. So making sure that, uh, that you have that good tool set for your vehicle so you can perform basic repairs on the trail, or if you've got to help somebody else, right, maybe your tools will cross over and help out their vehicle. Um, now, this one kind of goes along with tires, but you want to make sure that you have a full-size spare tire for your vehicle, right? Full-size spare tire that is in good condition because we don't want to get a flat tire that we can't fix, and then we put our spare on and it's dry rot, cracked, it's too old, and we can't drive it on the road. But this is the most common overlooked thing uh, with your spare tire. You need to make sure that you have the wheel lock key if you have some type of lug nut on your vehicle that locks, right? You need to have your wheel lock key to be able to take that off. Um, if you don't, chances are highly unlikely that anyone's going to have one that matches your vehicle. And a lot of vehicles now, even from the manufacturer, or if you get aftermarket wheels, they put on some type of locking lug nut on there that you need a special tool to get it off. So make sure you have that tool uh, when you come out on the trail. That way, if you get a flat tire, we can get that tire off and put your spare back on very easily and quickly. And again, knowing where that tool is, right? Um, so that you can get access to it very quickly and easily. All right. So let's talk um, a little bit more about some of the different things that you carry. I always recommend carrying some type of field expedient repair kit. And if you don't know what to carry in a field expedient repair kit, go back and watch our video. It's on our YouTube channel about field expedient repair, right? And I show the kit that I carry and a lot of the different pieces and parts of that kit to kind of describe what they're used for. But just small things like JB Weld, rescue tape or silicone tape, pantyhose, right? are a good thing to carry on the trail. Um, carrying some zip ties, carrying some spare bolts and nuts in case you need them uh, in that field expedient repair kit. And you can pack it right up with your tools if you need to. There are some awesome tool rolls out there that uh, will help you kind of pack all that gear up, excuse me, in a nice kind of confined space where you can keep it out of the way until you need it. But that field expedient repair kit, super important to carry. Um, and most of those items you can pick up at any advanced auto parts or AutoZone or Pep Boys, O'Reilly's, anything like that. Um, they're very easy to get. But if you're interested in that, go back and watch that YouTube video, right? It's a pretty good one, I think. All right. So with vehicle health, you may possibly need to carry some extra fluids, right? If you do damage to your cooling system, you do damage to your oil pan, you are probably going to have to replace those fluids at some point in time. Um, so go ahead and carry, you know, an extra quart of oil, a little bit of coolant so that you can put it in your vehicle if you need it in a pinch. Now, with kind of the last thing we talk about with vehicle health, and this isn't necessarily something to carry, but this is a very important thing that we see a lot of off-road. Before you even leave on your trip and you're packing all this gear, do your vehicle 360, but most importantly, check to make sure that your battery tie down is in place, right? Not a ratchet strap or a bungee cord or a zip ties or whatever. You need to have some type of aftermarket metal battery tie down or your factory tie downs in place. And this is overlooked, right? We don't want our battery bouncing around off road. Um, and I always see somebody's, you know, at the tech check-in at Trail Fest or Dixie Run, they're trying to put a ratchet strap or bungee cord around their battery to hold it in place. And that just doesn't cut it, right? Have a good tie down in place for your battery. All right, let's talk about personal uh, things that we should carry on the trail. And this one is, again, kind of very, very subjective uh, because some of these items that we carry, um, we have to be trained to use them, right? Uh, one thing that everybody's going to probably carry different pieces and parts of is a first aid kit, right? Think about what Al can treat out of his first aid kit. It's going to be very different from what I can treat with a first aid kit. 
And I think it's also one very overlooked item on the trail as far as uh, what we carry because we think, oh, I've got my vehicle, everything's okay. But I always tell everybody when it comes to our personal safety on the trail, a lot of times, even if you're in an off-road park, let's take Windrock, for example, or Adventure Off-Road Park, when you are out on that trail, right, even if you're in a group, you're outside of what we call uh, the golden hour, right? And that golden hour is uh, what the medical industry kind of calls it is, is that hour in which they can get you to the hospital where they can save life or limb, right? Out, anytime that you're outside of that golden hour, your chances of saving a finger, an arm or whatever, or even life starts to drop. So we need to have the tools needed in our first aid kit that we can use, right, or that you can use um, to treat whatever we have a problem with. And basic things, if we know we're allergic to bees and we need to make sure we have an EpiPen, right, or if we have problems with allergies, we need to have an EpiPen. But basic Band-Aids, gauze, things like that, very good items to carry, right? Um, even in mine, I'll carry stuff like some of that uh, powdered Pedialyte that I can mix in water for dehydration or um, like glucose uh, or something like that that I can mix to make a sugary drink for um, someone that may have uh, sugar issues. Um, but aspirin, right, is a good thing to carry. Ibuprofen, things like that are all good items to carry in your first aid kit. And you really don't need to have any type of certification, right, or training to use these type of items. If I get cut, I can put a Band-Aid on and prevent infection, right? Maybe a little bit of alcohol swabs or something like that. Now, if you are um, someone who carries some type of, like myself, I carry a wilderness uh, first aid certification, we will probably carry something a little bit more um, that we are certified to carry. Or if someone's an EMT, they may have a complete first aid kit. But again, carrying at least a small first aid kit is super important. Personal safety, it doesn't matter if you're just going out on the trail for a day, right? You're And you're at the off-road park. You need to carry water for two days. If you're going out for one, I always carry water for two days. That way, if something does happen, or I come across somebody that needs water, I can give it away and it's not gonna take away from what I have. But if something does happen and I have to walk out, I'm gonna have extra water on hand. Or if I break down and end up working on my Jeep until the until the wee hours of the morning, right? At least then I know I've got enough water to sustain myself. Sustain myself. And depending on the climate you're in um, and where you're at, I do carry some type of like survival blanket uh, in the vehicle in case I need uh, to warm up, right? If I'm trapped in the cold or something along those lines. But I also will carry some non-perishable style foods or foods that have a long-term uh, kind of lasting uh, in the vehicle, like granola bars or snacks and stuff like that. Not necessarily stuff that's a bunch of junk food that's not going to carry me a long ways, but I will carry some type of granola bar or something like that that I can snack on and keep my energy up throughout the day. And that way I don't get hangry, right? Or if I come across somebody that's getting a little hangry, I just hand them a granola bar. Uh, but if you're out on the trail with Jay, right, you're going to have ice cream. So everything's good. You're good to go. So, <laughs> but just carrying some food and water and I typically carry enough water to last me two days. That's the most important thing. And again, if I'm going out for four days and I carry enough water for eight days, right? So you see the effect, I kind of double what I need to make sure that I have enough. Um, so after food and water and medical kits, comfort items, right? So weather can be very, very unpredictable. So I do carry a rain poncho or a set of rain gear in my vehicle. Normally rain gear packs up really easily. It's something that we can store in, if it's a poncho in the glove box or something along those lines. But if it starts raining and I have to do a recovery, Nobody wants to be soaking wet um, or run the chance of getting sick. So that way I've got something that uh, I can put over myself and stay at least somewhat dry getting in and out of my vehicle and not ruining the interior of my vehicle. Or if I'm riding with Al, you know, I don't want to ruin the interior of Al's Jeep too much. Um, so I will carry that and I will typically bring a pair of socks uh, with me and change of socks just because if socks get wet or I do have to wear them for a longer period of time in my vehicle, I will change them out to protect my feet. I'm kind of a, a sock guy, right? I, I like to have nice socks on my feet and I can take a lot of abuse as long as my feet are comfortable. So 
I do carry extra socks on the trail with me. Now, with personal safety and the gear that you're carrying, um, that's kind of a, a breakdown of the stuff that I carry when I go out on the trail. But again, these are items that you need to have in your vehicle always and anyways when you go out. Don't leave out and go on the trail and leave it back at the campsite, right? Or um, leave it somewhere where it's not easily accessible, like packed underneath all of your uh, tent and everything inside the vehicle. Have it somewhere where you can access it very quickly. What I like about first aid kits or how I like to store them typically is first off in a in a bright container, right? Bright red container or at least have the, the bright first aid insignia on it um, and written on it in bright letters, first aid. I really like, and one thing I like about Jeeps is the Molly panels on the back of the seats. And I'll get one of the bags and I'll hang it there, right? That way everybody knows, excuse me, where it is and it's easy to find. If I got hurt and somebody else had to run and grab it, they're going to be able to find it in my vehicle very easily. So things like that and your personal safety items really make them easily accessible to where you can get to it. Now water, not such a big deal, right? But make sure it's not going to be somewhere where your container is going to get punctured on the trail and then it's going to leak out inside your vehicle. Um, I know sometimes people will carry like the big gallon jugs of water, the two and a half gallon jugs of water, and I've seen those get punctured. They leak out inside the vehicle and then you're completely out of water. So make sure that's in a safe place um, that you can easily access. Preferably a fridge in your vehicle so it's nice and cold on a hot day. So, uh, but, you know, that's another item very similar to your uh, recovery gear that needs to be nice and nice and safe. All right, so let's talk about kind of packing and outfitting your vehicle. And I'm gonna, I want to go a little bit more in depth about some of the packing stuff we talked about when we go out on the trail, right? Or even before we leave home to go on a trip. I always kind of kind of chuckle to myself when I see the vo the vehicles going down the road um, and they've got a ton of stuff on their roof rack and they've got a ton of stuff in the vehicles. They can't see out the windows, but none of it's tied down, right? Or everything's thrown in the back of the pickup truck and none of it's tied down. So we know that our recovery gear needs to be accessible, but not stored up high. We know that our personal safety items need to be accessible. Um, and they can typically they're lighter, so they can be stored higher. Um, but our vehicle tools and stuff are heavy items that we can pack down low inside the vehicle to help keep that weight down low. Then we can pack some of our camping gear and stuff on top of that. We typically want to keep any of these heavy items out of kind of the top of a vehicle off of a roof rack um, or something of that sort. So I know, you know, when, when you have Jeeps, you want to hang stuff from your roll bars. And you have these, these grab bags and stuff, which are great because items are secured. Just make sure it's not a super heavy item that you're putting up higher that's going to cause some issues. Even your fire extinguishers bolt to your roll bars and stuff. A lot of times I like to try to keep those as low down as possible. That way they don't become a flying projectile. And everything that you have in your vehicle, even the soft items, need to be tied down and secured. So... I always tell everyone, if you don't want me to have you lay on the ground and me drop it from about six feet on your head, it needs to be tied down. Because in the event of a rollover or even bouncing around on the trail, if you roll over, now this item is going to be flying around. Think about like a bow shackle flying around and hitting you in the head or a fire extinguisher hitting you in the head. It's going to cause some major damage. Um, but... Just bouncing around on the trail, think about a driver, you know, bouncing around on the trail, something bounces off the dash and hits them, right? Or lands in their lap and it's a heavier item. Now, if they're looking at that, they're not looking at the trail. If we're on the side of a mountain, this could cause an accident of driving off the mountain. I always um, talk about cell phones at this point in time too, because now our cell phones are a whole lot heavier, right? They're bigger and they're heavier. Um, they're basically miniature computers that we carry in our hands. But when we are driving down the trail, if we get in a rollover, the uh, uh, Highway Patrol did a test back when the old style flip phones that in a 35 mile an hour impact on the roads, a cell phone, the old style flip phones, right, 
were enough to cause a, a concussion in small children and kids, right? So make sure your cell phone is somewhere where it's kind of secured or tied down. And this also kind of goes for your comms on the trail, right? Your radios that you're carrying. Um, you know, just a little handheld radios can do some damage. Uh, and in the event of a rollover, it could break out the glass in your view. So make sure you're kind of keeping an eye on that type stuff. Put it in the center console or put it somewhere where it's going to be tied down and safe. Um, so then stuff on the roof rack, I typically use uh, the double tie down method. I make sure I have two separate things tying it down on a roof, roof rack. Um, and I try again, stay away from heavy items up there, but things like tents and um, coolers and stuff like that I may put up there. But if I do, I put two ratchet straps on it or more. That way I don't just have one that could fail. I always make sure I have a backup one to kind of tie it down. So um, that's a lot of gear and stuff that you have to carry on the trail, guys. But the most important thing to remember is not wheeling alone and spread the load out, right? Have that gear, spread the load out a little bit, and make sure before you leave camp, right, or you can even back up before you leave home, Talk with the people that you're going out with and say, hey, are you bringing this? Okay, since you aren't, I'm going to bring this, right? Just like you'd have a list for a Sunday picnic and multiple families. Who's bringing what on the trail? So, uh, but when you get ready to go out on the trail, make sure, guys, that you've got all these items with you, at least spread throughout the group. Have a checklist that you can go through and say, all right, who's got this piece of recovery kit, this piece of recovery kit, this piece of recovery kit. All right, Al, how we doing? Do we have any uh, do we have any good questions? Well, we've got uh, we've got some people watching tonight that have watched the previous episodes, and uh, guess what? Deborah's out there tonight. <laughs> so Deborah has the first question for you: Is what do you do about your kids and your fur babies when you're out there? traveling on the trails so um let's start with kids first right and uh so for kids i always make sure that i have snacks and water for them not sugary drinks like coke and stuff like that i always make sure that i have enough water for them as well and good healthy snacks to give them energy throughout the day um and i make sure that kids especially the younger they are i have a change of clothes for them Never fails, right? The kids are going to find the one mud puddle on the trail. Um, and once they get muddy and covered up, then it's a mess after that, right? But they could get miserable um, if they are muddy and then they're sitting in the vehicle for extended periods of time. I also, if you have smaller kids, I think it's a good thing to carry one of those nice, comfortable neck wraps for them on the trail so, so that their head's not bouncing around a whole lot and it's nice and kind of secured in place. But the same rules apply on the trail as on the road as far as like car seats and stuff like that as well. And if you have a kid um, and you're expecting them to be happy on the trail all day, uh, don't be disappointed if they start to get bored, right? Bring them something uh, interactive that they can play with, not necessarily like a tablet or something like that, but have some type of uh, nature thing that they can get involved with. Like our kids had these um, nature books that had exercises that they could go through like uh, I spy games of different nature items on the trail, or you can play that game yourself without some type of book, but think about ways to kind of engage the kids on the trail. That way they're not just bouncing around in the back seat and they'll enjoy off-roading for years to come. Fur babies, right? And this is another one we take our dogs with us off-road. Have a good container that they can drink out of, right? I see a lot of people, they get on the trail and they pour the water in their hand and then they feed it to their dogs. That's hard for a dog really to get good amounts of water out of. So have a nice bowl that they can drink out of. Um, you know, for us, we've got two big laps. So we have to have a big bowl because they'll put their whole big old, big old heads in there. Um, so we'll have a nice bowl that we can fill up with water. And typically I'll just carry like gallon milk jugs that I can pour that out with. But a very commonly overlooked thing is a first aid kit for your dogs because that's going to be very different than a first aid kit for you, right? Um, so look into what possibly your dog might need um, in the event of a snake bite, in the event that they get hurt um, and are 
need some type of, of care as far as bandaging or something like that because we can't just use standard band-aids and stuff like that on them so having a um, good pair of tweezers for removing ticks and things like that from them in there um, some alcohol swabs and a good pair of tweezers also for removing like burrs in their feet and stuff like that is a huge huge thing for your dogs and just some type of snack form dogs typically can go quite a bit longer but I always like to carry a good snack for them. That way they enjoy kind of being in the vehicle. So let's look at the next question here real quick. Uh, are tracks part of recovery gear? Do you really need them? Yes and no. Um, I love traction, traction mats, and I carry them a lot. Um, but are they a necessary piece of recovery gear? Not necessarily. Um, I they are expensive, right? They are an investment. Um, some of the cheaper ones out there, yes, they're cheaper, uh, but to really invest in them and get a good set, then you really want to look at, you know, some of the bigger name brands that are on the market. But I love traction mats for several reasons. One, I typically will carry a bright colored set because now I can highlight my line down a trail and lay them out. Um, two, if I need to kind of stack to get up over something, the, the mats typically are a quick, easy way to do that without me having to move rocks, right? And in certain areas, rocks, hot, snakes could be under it, black widows and stuff like that. So traction mats can be a safer thing or a safer alternative to that that also add traction. Um, and most importantly, you know, I sleep in a rooftop tent. They allow me to level out my truck so I can sleep in my rooftop tent, nice and level, slight elevation to my feet, right? <laughs> but they do work well for that. But I like carrying traction mats. Do you have to? No, but they are a very, very quick way a lot of times to recover yourself, and they do have a lot of uses. Okay, so Holly down in Florida has this question. What compression do you recommend? So I recommend the ARB compressors, and there are a lot of good compressors on the market. Um, I know a lot of people prefer, prefer Viair. Um, I don't have a lot of experience with Viair. I run strictly ARB because, number one, ARB has been in the compressor game for a long time, right? So they've developed their compressors, um, and I've done a lot of testing with them, um, both separate from ARB and with ARB. Uh, to be able to kind of verify that they are a good compressor. Also, they are performance-wise very, very strong, right? I've never had an ARB compressor fail on me uh, that was outside of a bad installation, right? Um, but that wasn't the compressor's fault. But I've never had one fail on me. And performance-wise, for me as a trainer and guide, I can run like their twin compressor, 100% duty cycle, and I can air up multiple vehicles before some people – um, with some of the other style compressors on the market can air up their own. So that's why I run ARB. Um, also, their warranty is exceptional, um, and their customer service, as far as that, is very, very good. Okay, so Deborah, Deborah, now she just got her a synthetic rope. So, so did she make a mistake or not? So she's asking <laughs> you what's the best brand so she can decide, and then what's the best length. So synthetic rope, um, you know, brand wise, there's tons of brands out on the market. There really isn't like a like a best brand, right? Um, and it's it's very much like like tissue paper or tissues, right? We all know Kleenex, but there's also tons of other tissues out there. But we just kind of call it tissues. But like Amsteel Blue, um, Dyneema style fibers, uh, synthetic winch lines in general, they're all pretty much fairly similar. Um, as long as they are of that Dyneema style fiber, you've got a good synthetic winch line, right? And it's a good proper rating uh, for your vehicle. Lengthwise, uh, if it's on my winch, typically I'll carry somewhere between, for me, I like to have somewhere between 50 and 60 feet on my winch. And I carry a 50 foot or 40 to 50 foot winch line extension. So I have somewhere close to a uh, hundred feet of reach that I can get out to, but with my winch, I don't have so much winch line on there that I have to spool off a ton of winch line to get down to the power band of my winch, that last layer, right? So I do tend to carry less than most people on my winch, where a lot of winches come with somewhere between 80 to 100 feet on them. 
So if you use your winch line extension, how do you connect that then to your primary winch line? So I connect it a lot of times with a soft shackle um, because typically uh, the ends of it are, are fairly uh, soft. So I can just put a soft shackle through there uh, and connect it in place. Uh, Deborah wants to know, hey, she's got 6.5 inch lift. I think she's talking about high lift jack here. What size jack does she get? So the only size high lift jack that I recommend for any of the style vehicles, even your stock Jeeps and stuff like that, is carrying the 60 inch high lift. Um, Jeeps especially now, they have so much flex that a 48 inch high lift, a stock Jeep, it'll barely get a tire off the ground. So I recommend carrying the 68 inch high lift jack. How do you know what size of soft shackle? Deborah, so, she's got a new winch line now, synthetic winch line. So now she's out shopping for soft shackles. And I am too, by the way. So I'm very interested in hearing the answer to this. One. So I typically like, if you if you measure kind of end to end, the soft shackle that's somewhere kind of in the 20 to 22 inch range, that, um, sometimes a little bit shorter, but I don't like ones that are a lot longer than that, right? So that when I put them in a loop configuration, they're still relatively small. I don't have a big, long connection in the line. Um, so I like kind of the shorter, more compact ones. I know some people on the market now do have these really long ones, uh, but to me, that's just a lot more to manage. The whole benefit, one of the major benefits to a soft shackle is they're small, easy to pack, and lightweight to carry. If we start carrying really big ones, then it's just a pain to carry them. Let, let me see what Wendy says here. Uh, I was looking last night at ARB Compressor, they have a few options. You re recommend a certain kind of ARB compressor. I, I do. Um, so, well, it depends on your vehicle, right? So they have basically a single compressor and then a twin compressor. The single compressor is 50% duty cycle. Um, and uh, it is good up to a 35 inch tire, right? But a 35 inch tire is kind of at, at the top. It's going to be really taking a long time to air it up whereas the twin it's a hundred percent duty cycle and it's good up to any tire you're ever going to run on your vehicle um, i run a twin because of that hundred percent duty cycle but again it's because i'm airing up multiple vehicles um, and i can run air tools and stuff like that on it but the single typically for most people is a good uh, option uh, and it's going to do very well for airing up the tires on your vehicle and then it just comes down to portable versus uh, vehicle mounted for your choice. Um, and I think with the Viair, um, is it the 450P I think that they have, that's the portable one rated for most up to like a 35 or a 37 inch tire as well. Okay. So Darlene's helping us out here. We talked about element fire extinguishers a few minutes ago. She, she ran out to her Jeep and looked at hers and she's telling us that it's safe for electric plastic Waterproof, no residue, no non-toxic, eco-friendly, and I think it'll wash the dishes if you program it right. <laughs> I I would actually, uh, when I see you guys at Trail Fest, I would love to take a look at that um, because I think that's a, if, especially if it's eco-friendly, because a lot of fire extinguishers, you really should clean up after it. Ooh, ooh, Al, I almost, ooh. I almost didn't say anything. Tread lightly. A spill kit. A spill kit. Should have a spill kit in your vehicle. Okay. All right. So uh, one more question. This is the last one. Drum roll. Do you carry extra gas? And if yes, what's the best container? So if I'm just going out on the trail, I typically don't. For the day, I don't carry extra gas. Um, I make sure that my vehicle is filled up to the top. I top it off um, completely full right before I go on the trail. If I'm going out for multiple days, right, then I go ahead and budget five gallons of fuel per day uh, if I'm going out. So if I go out for five days, I carry 25 extra gallons of fuel. Container-wise, there are tons of different containers on the market. Um, but I find that the old style jerry cans is about the best. Uh, I try to stay away from, you know, your standard just kind of 
red gas cans because in hotter climates they just expand so much and, and don't let the vapors out. So I do carry just kind of the old style jerry cans for fuel. We see these little little narrow roto packs containers. Yeah, that's what they roto packs. Is that what they're called? Yeah, they're they are very good. Um, you do have to be careful. The reason I typically don't talk about those is most people put them on their vehicle and then forget about them and leave fuel in them, and they will uh, they will expand to the point where they come apart. But they are a great way to carry fuel, um, typically in a safe way on your vehicle, uh, and they're an easy way to fuel your vehicle up. You just need to make sure that you do still vent the, the kind of fumes off of them. Uh, but it's, again, hard to carry large amounts of fuel with them. Okay, so I think I've covered all the questions that came in. Um, do you have anything else, Mike? That's it, Mike. Go have, go have a good evening. Tell Sarah and the boys I said hey. Will do. Everyone, have a wonderful evening, and we will see you guys soon at Trail Fest. Thank you, guys.